Cool. Um, okay. Uh, and first up, uh, we have wrong direction. First up, we have Matt Steele from Omaha, Nebraska. All right. Uh, Matt is a front end and mobile developer at Union Pacific Railroad. He blogs at steel.blue and loves hooking things together that shouldn't go together. Uh, Matt's going to talk to us today about uh, Web Bluetooth API, a new way to control physical devices directly from your browser. We'll see how to build web apps that react to Bluetooth inputs, how to reverse engineer strange array buffer streams, and how to power your conference slide deck with a bicycle. Uh, everyone, give it up for Matt, our first speaker at the 2020 200 OK virtual conference. Take it away, Matt. Hey, uh, thanks, thanks again, uh, Max, Kendall, and everyone uh, at Techlahoma and 200 OK for letting me present. You know, I've been down to Oklahoma City for the Thunder Plains conference a few years. I was really hoping to make it down uh, to Oklahoma again, uh, see a red dirt. Um, it's really fun, and you all have built just a fantastic community. So, um, you know, we'll have to we'll have to do it digitally, uh, virtually this year. But uh, in the future, really excited to to come down and visit again. But that's not what I really want to get uh, out of it uh, out of this talk today. Um, really, what what I'd like for you to take away from my presentation uh, and about web Bluetooth in general is meh. Or, or more specifically, uh, I want you to think about meh.com. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have been to this website, uh, but meh.com is amazing and, uh, and a fantastic place for you to uh, go visit. Met is kind of like Woot if you've been to there. In fact, it was put together by the same people that built Woot. Um, it's a daily deal website um, that has just about the best copywriting uh, that I've seen on any website. A lot of times I don't even like the products that they're trying to sell. Um, a lot of them are kind of garbage, to be honest, but uh, they but they just hire the best writers and it's always entertaining. One of the things that Met does uh, really well is they sell a bunch of uh, products at dirt cheap prices uh, that uh, that either have some sort of structural flaw or marketed badly or uh, or have some other reason why they just were off offloaded to this kind of dumping ground. Uh, and one of one of the things that com consistently comes up uh, from that are Bluetooth devices. Um, these Bluetooth devices, uh, you know, your internet of things uh, tend to not sell as well as the producers had originally hoped. And so they end up on meh. So you might find some just ridiculous items on here. Uh, did you know that Banana Boat, the, uh, uh, the sunscreen company, made some floating Bluetooth speakers? I didn't know that either, but they're selling it on meh. Uh, how about a barbecue thermometer uh, that has Bluetooth uh, functionality enabled? Um, you know, I, I'm guessing that someone wants this sort of device, but uh, it's, it's not me. Well, actually, I say that, and yet I, I bought one. So. Uh, you know, uh, maybe you want a Bluetooth turntable. Um, you know, okay, maybe there maybe there's some value in that. I don't know, um, but they're but they're everywhere. Uh, they sell a Bluetooth padlock. I think the idea here is that if you are going to the gym and you wanted to lock or unlock, but your phone is probably already in the locker. So uh, again, like mm -mm, these, not all these devices have been fully thought through, um, but, and which is why they kind of end up on on this website. But this is. You know, this is just uh, this is these are Scooby snacks for me. They're they're so tempting and tantalizing, especially at dirt cheap prices, to pick up as many of these devices as possibly can. So the end result is that I end up having just a ton of these Bluetooth devices that I have lying around. You know, I see it; they're they're sold for like you know pennies on the dollar, and it's like, well, I, all right, I'm going to click this button and buy it. Uh, but now, you know, the question is kind of what. What do you do with all of these things, and how do you manage all of them? And like, what do you, what do you end up actually doing with them? And there's, you know, there's there's issues beyond just that they physically take up a bunch of space uh, in your in your uh, house. 
You also, they take up digital space. Um, each one requires separate apps to run and install. Um, putting each of them on your phone is, you know, it's kind of table stakes, or at least that's, that's the way that it generally kind of works. Um, you know, and, and some, of these, uh, some of these apps, like you have no idea what they are. Like I bought a Bluetooth light bulb a while back and it, you know, trying to just understand what it was trying to pass. Like I, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're kind of putting, uh, uh, you're, you're installing software onto, you know, your personal device that I don't, I don't know what this is doing. So that's, that's kind of where the web Bluetooth protocol uh, is, is meant to solve. Uh, this is the a newish specification that's been around for a few years now uh, that tries to solve the problem of letting you use Bluetooth devices from a web browser inside of a sandboxed environment uh, so that you have full control over the devices rather than just depending on the device's uh, software and apps to like not break and, and break your phones. I think these are really fun um, and, and they really afford you new opportunities to play around with your hardware like you haven't had before. Um, all of these are built around the idea of the Bluetooth low energy or Bluetooth smart protocol. Um, most newer devices support this protocol. Um, you might have heard this as Bluetooth 4.0. Um, usually they uh, have very low power requirements. Uh, they also have low bandwidth. Generally a Bluetooth low energy will only uh, transfer data less than a megabit per second. Um, usually like game controllers might have this, uh, light bulbs, anything that's kind of emitting data uh, tends to work pretty well for this protocol. These aren't your Bluetooth headphones. Um, those tend to be Bluetooth Classic, uh, which has a higher bandwidth. Um, but, uh, but a lot of the kind of Internet of Things types of devices, like if you have a refrigerator that's Bluetooth enabled for some reason, uh, it's probably going to be running on Bluetooth Low Energy. The protocol for Bluetooth Low Energy is, uh, is built around kind of a nesting set of stacks. So, on a, so you have a Bluetooth server, uh, which is connected to a particular device. So in this case, it's trying to show a, uh, a peripheral of a, say, a heart rate monitor. So, you know, these, these things that maybe you were forced to wear in like a high school gym class um, that you, you know, strap around your chest. So this, con this contains a Bluetooth uh, service. Uh, so this device uh, is a server that has uh, a couple of Bluetooth services associated with it. And a Bluetooth service is just a collection of characteristics. And these characteristics are the actual values uh, that produce or, uh, or receive data from a Bluetooth client. So in this case, a heart rate monitor may have a characteristic that has static data, such as just where is this located? Where is this peripheral? So for a, a, a chest heart rate monitor, it would just say this is on the person's body. If you're wearing one that was on their wrist, it might say wrist. So this might be static. It might also be dynamic, you know, a, a characteristic of just what is the current heart rate of the person that's wearing this. And that can be emitting data once every second, once every, you know, uh, or, or just whenever the data changes. Um, so, so every Bluetooth device uh, is going to have at least one service and one or more characteristics inside of those services. Uh, this, uh, this specification is called the GATT protocol, which stands for General Attribute Profile. Um, and, and this is relatively standardized, but within that standard, there's a lot of variants that you kind of have to work through. The API for a web Bluetooth uh, enabled application is pretty straightforward. Um, all that you have to specify is look at the navigator.bluetooth property that's available inside of a browser. It probably makes sense to do some feature testing as uh, not every browser supports this. So you can do a, a basic test uh, inside of JavaScript that says, if, you, uh, if the navigator.bluetooth uh, property is available, then you can call the request device function. And this, uh, this function takes a set of arguments that says, what type of device are you trying to connect to? There's a number of properties that you can specify here. 
but the main ones are you can you can uh, try to filter what type of service you're looking for. So uh, Bluetooth, the GATT protocol, has a number of well-defined services that can be accessed just via a string. So in this case, you can say, just give me any device that has information about its battery, and that's what the battery service is. Um, the last I checked, there were about 42 of these well-defined services, uh, and those are pretty easy to access. Not every device is set up like this. Um, there's certainly more than 42 different types of devices. And so each of these have a universal identifier, which is just a big string of uh, hex digits. So you can also just say, just give me every any device that, uh, that has this UUID of a service that it provides. Um, how you get that UUID is another question, and we'll talk about that later. Once you have access to this, then uh, once you request the device, uh, then uh, your uh, browser will open up and it'll say, hey, somebody, some, uh, you know, uh, can you pair up with this, app, uh, with this Bluetooth device? And then the user has to accept it um, or they can reject it. And after the user accepts it, then uh, what it returns back is a promise. So you can use a dot then function and, uh, and do something with that device that you've just accessed. There's still a bit of ceremony that you have to go through uh, in order to actually uh, start receiving or sending data to the device. So once you have the device, then you have to call a GHTT connect. That returns another promise. And then once you have the Bluetooth server, then you can begin to access the service and those characteristics. So first you access it, you access the Bluetooth service by saying get primary service. That returns a promise. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> you can ask for a particular characteristic, which also returns a promise. And then you can begin to read values from that characteristic. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, you can just say, <clears throat> uh, get me a, uh, get me the battery level. So read value will return a single value uh, from that characteristic, which in this case, I'm asking for the battery level uh, characteristic. So this will tell me how much battery is left in my, um, you know, in the application. So what you get back from the read value is generally going to be a uh, a list of bytes. So it's uh, as opposed to like a string or a number. Um, and so you end up having to parse it, uh, you know, using different uh, different strategies. And we'll talk through what some of those are in, uh, in just a bit. So because of this all works with promises. Uh, you also can rewrite this. Uh, I prefer to like to use the async and await uh, uh, syntax, but this just helps to clean up the, the code a little bit. But once you're done, then you can begin to uh, actually look at the data. And so let me show what this looks like. <clears throat> so in this case, I'm saying, give me any uh, any device that has a Bluetooth uh, information that's just emitting information about what type of device, who its manufacturer is, stuff like that. And it takes a little bit of time, but you can see that it has uh, uh, that it's connected to the server. Uh, it's found a uh, uh, the model, the firm, and the manufacturer name. So in this case, it's Thermos, which is the smart Bluetooth enabled water bottle. Uh, I guess in case you want to know how much water is left in here? I don't know, but. So that's uh, that's the device information, uh, or that's just, that's that's connecting in general. Um, so so reading data, like, you know, again, it, there's, there's some ceremony that you have to go through, but it's not bad. Um, you know, in total to get information from a physical device in, five or six lines of code, I think is, is really powerful. Um, and you don't just have the ability to read for data once, you can also listen to a stream of events. Um, so uh, again, to, uh, to do a one-time read, you can add an event listener. But then if you want to send notifications, uh, then you also add an additional line, which is this characteristic dot start notifications. And uh, this uh, also returns a promise and after it's done, then if the Bluetooth device uh, starts to send uh, multiple streams of data, 
for example, with a heart rate monitor, you might get one for each beat that a person has. Um, then you can just start to receive those notifications that way. So again, like specifically for the heart rate monitor, the code is really straightforward. Um, all that you say is, I would like to request a heart rate device, um, start notifications, and then uh, every time that the value changes, just handle it appropriately. So uh, in, you know, in uh, if we're giving this talk live, uh, I would actually uh, do this, but instead I had to record a, a bunch of silly demos. So you'll have to bear with me here. But uh, in this case, I'm connecting up to a heart rate monitor that I'm wearing. And you can see that it's starting to hopefully uh, start going up a little bit. I will say that I was not expecting uh, a technical presentation to actually wind me, and now my uh, now my arms are a little bit sore from uh, from this yesterday. But but again, like it's you know this this just works out of the box, so that was kind of fun. There's a number of other devices that you can use. Um, uh, I got another uh, one uh, purchased that I had mentioned was this uh, this Bluetooth uh, enabled barbecue thermometer. Um, it's you know it has an app. Uh, that uh, sends you notifications when your uh, food reaches a particular temperature. Um, I've never used it that way. I've strictly used it to kind of play around with data. But there's a, uh, but in the same way, um, you can uh, connect up to one of these devices and, uh, and begin to read the values that come out of it. So in this case, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm connecting up to the application uh, and then you can see that it's starting to uh, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time for it to connect, but then whenever it's uh, completed, then you can see that uh, the data starts to come through. And so you get this hex value, this 230103, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the data that comes out out of the box. Um, so what does that actually mean? How do you convert that into an actual temperature? Well, there's no easy answer, um, but if you, uh, if you like working with byte streams or reading unsigned integers, uh, then then this is your lucky day. Um, I uh, this was new to me, so well, you know it was it was a bit interesting. If you're lucky, uh, then uh, then the uh, hardware manufacturer might have sent some specifications out. Um, you know, depending for all of those well-known Bluetooth uh, specifications, those are available, and so you can just read it and you can say, oh. You know, at this point, uh, there are a set of bits, and this bit is, or this data is x bits long, and you can read it, and um, and it will tell you the actual value that you have. Uh, for these, you know, bargain basement devices, uh, I'm not quite that lucky, so uh, you're kind of on your own. You have to end up parsing it yourself. So as I was reading through, uh, you know, the you can just start to receive a set of this data and then try to reverse engineer what, what might be happening. So one thing that I noticed uh, is that these particular bits, the D102, uh, were, uh, you know, they changed every time that the temperature changed. So at 65 degrees, it was A002. At 72, it was D302. 77 was FE02. And then at 83 degrees, it was 3B03. And I kind of looked at that and was like, what, what is going on here? And then uh, my fiance mentioned, it's like, well, maybe this is big Endian notation. Uh, and, and turns out that she was right. Uh, the, the changing the, uh, the Endianness of the 16-bit uh, 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 byte that you were, or 16-bit uh, value that you were trying to grab was the important part. This is something that I hadn't thought about since college programming days. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it comes back anytime that you end up working with hardware like this. So, uh, putting this comma true at the very end says change the endianness of the bytes that you're trying to read, um, so that the, the major values are on the, on the front instead of on the back. Again, this will just depend on the device that you're working with, but, um, yeah, that was, that was a fun, fun piece. But the end result of all of this is that now, uh, you know, you should be able to connect up and uh, and actually begin to read the value 
Like once you know exactly where to parse it from, uh, you can just uh, you can read those specific values every time that data is emitted from it. So you can see that you know the both the byte value changes as well as the temperature. So it goes to 43. One thing that I thought was kind of interesting was that this device actually has more specific data that's being emitted from it, but it doesn't show it on the LCD. So you only get down to the 44 degrees, but actually it's reading as 43.7. So reading data is pretty straightforward. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, write data, that's not bad either. Um, it just takes a little bit of uh, different um, bit manipulation. When you're writing values to a characteristic, you can use the characteristic dot write value uh, command. Um, that also returns a promise. Uh, but generally what you end up having to write is not a string or a number, but a, uh, an, uh, uh, an array of bytes. So in this case, you might want to do an unsigned 8-bit integer array, and then you can use these hex values. So you know, 0x, zero 0x5. Zero Again, like I'm a JavaScript person. Um, I don't deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so the, the question is, like, what do, you, what do you actually use for this array buffer? How do you build this out? And again, the, the answer is it depends. It depends on which type of device that you're working with um, and, and what those values are looking for. So one example of a device that I was playing around with um, is this Bluetooth enabled light bulb. Um, uh, this device, right, it's, it's kind of like a night light. Um, you know, you can tap it and it'll get different colors. Um, it has an app that's associated with it as well. But, uh, and that app will allow it to change colors. So let's say that you wanted to, uh, you know, write a, uh, write a program that will change these colors programmatically. Well, you can do that. And again, if you're lucky, uh, then there will be a specification that the manufacturer produces. Um, this manufacturer, unfortunately, has gone out of business and their website is closed. So again, you're out of luck there. So if you don't have a specification on what you can do, then you end up having to reverse engineer it. Um, and there's, there's a couple of ways that you can do this, some easier than others. On iOS, there's a couple of Bluetooth sniffing applications that you can use. Um, I really like the Light BLE. This lets you connect up to Bluetooth devices, um, connect into their services, and just send raw Bluetooth um, hex values to a characteristic, just to play around with it and see what happens whenever you, whenever you mess around. Um, so, so this sort of app works really well. There's an Android version of this uh, as well uh, called the NRF Connect application. And, um, and again, this lets you connect to devices uh, and send and receive data just in kind of a standalone kind of sandbox area. So, uh, so just kind of testing stuff um, is, you know, you, you have some tools that are available for that. But how do you know even what to send in the first place or what's being sent? And you end up having to kind of reverse engineer what these values are. Um, what I found is that uh, it's kind of easiest to do this on Android devices. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason for this is that if you enable developer mode on an Android device, there's an option in here called enable Bluetooth HCI snoop log. And what this does is it allows for you to capture any traffic that's coming from your uh, Android device via Bluetooth to any of its connectors. So what you can do is enable the snoop log um, open up the official app that's uh, available for the device and just send some random data uh, back and forth. Um, and then it produces a file, which you can then uh, you know, drop onto a uh, computer. And you can use standard network sniffing tools such as Wireshark to uh, actually view the values that are being sent or received from this device. Um, so in this case, I can see that I was uh, connecting up to my device. Uh, this is the Bluetooth light bulb. Uh, and you know, this is the service that it was sending. This is the characteristic uh, UUID. And this is just the hex value that was being sent one way or the other. So, uh, so again, you can, you can just start to look at these different values and see well, what's, what's similar between them. You, know, you kind of reverse engineer it a little bit. Uh, and then the end result is that you can kind of figure out what the, you know, what the values that you need to send are. So in this case, 
um, you can write this value and I have to pass in 0xAA, 0x16, that's the like boilerplate. And then you can just put these specific red, green, and blue colors um, in these hex values. So the end result of all this is that you can connect up to an application. I'm, uh, and then after it connects, then you can just, you know, I'm just tapping on the different colors and it gives me the, uh, you know, the options uh, to play around. Uh, and in this case, I'm just using the input type equals color uh, to, uh, to choose the diff different colors. But you can kind of, kind of go crazy with this, right? Um, it's at, at this point, it's your code and the world is your oyster. So one of the tools that I built uh, was uh, a, a little game uh, using both a Bluetooth light bulb and this Bluetooth scale uh, that tries to detect uh, whether something is a mouse or not. So first I have to connect up. And if it's a mouse, it turns green. If it's a mouse, it turns green. If it's not a mouse, right? And that's whether it's too light or too heavy. So now, so now we're hooking up different Bluetooth devices together to, to see how they kind of play around. You know, and I, uh, I couldn't help but, uh, but try to channel my Indiana Jones and try and do the, uh, the bag of sand swap. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work quite as well. Uh, I had too much fun with this. But, but there's plenty of these different types of devices that you, can, that you can work with. And once you start to see that there are Bluetooth devices that are around, uh, then you, you begin to see them everywhere. For instance, one of the, uh, you know, I'm a cyclist and one of the uh, peripherals that I had bought a while ago was a speed and cadence sensor. Um, this is a device that hooks up to your, uh, uh, to your bicycle. Uh, honestly, it's just kind of a glorified counter, um, but uh, there's two parts to it. So one is this uh, sensor and it connects up and it just reads a magnet that's hooked up to your rear wheel. And as that's spinning around, uh, then you can start to see, uh, you know, it'll tell you how many revolutions uh, per minute your wheel is, t uh, is traveling and you can do some math to figure out what its speed is. There's also a sensor that goes on your crank arm uh, on the pedal. And so that will let you uh, see how fast you're pedaling, what your, what your uh, pedal's cadence is. The sensor um, is just emitting Bluetooth data uh, in many cases. And one of the cool things about it is that uh, it, uh, this is a well-defined service in the Bluetooth specification. So you don't even have to do any like crazy reverse engineering. You can just say, I would like to connect up to a speed and cadence sensor uh, and, and get me uh, the CSC measurement characteristic. Once you have that, then you can just start to receive those values and what you end up getting is this data. And so as I'm demoing this, I'm connecting up, uh, I'm connecting to the Bluetooth sensor. And now you can see the, the raw data that's being sent out. So as I begin pedaling, right? So, the, so there's just a whole string of hex values uh, that are coming out of the system. It's like, well, okay, what, is, what does that actually mean? Um, and luckily, you don't even have to uh, reverse engineer this. Um, the, the Bluetooth specification for cadence and speed uh, is, is well-defined, so you can just look at the specification and implement that in code. So as an example, the first flag on here, uh, there are eight bits of data. Um, the first two will tell you just general information. Um, so it tells you uh, if this bit is set to true, then there is a wheel revolution data. If, uh, and if the second bit is true, then it tells you if the crank revolution is true. Like, so if this data is available or not. So you can convert this into code. Um, and you know, the, the code itself isn't all that interesting, um, but you can, you, know, you can just receive this data, grab the particular flags uh, and, uh, and do some you know, bit manipulation um, if, you're, uh, if you're comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable, then you end up searching Stack Overflow for a lot. 
uh, which is what I ended up doing. Um, but it was still it was still kind of fun. There's more process to getting this stuff to uh, be available. So if the data is available, then you grab another set of data. Again, this is all just well defined. You can get crank information. Uh, and then the end result of this is as I'm connecting up, now I can get kind of semi parse data. So um, again, I'll, I'll demo. Uh, and now I can see both the raw data. And as I'm uh, parsing it out, I can see that it gives me four bits of data. Um, the, the total number of uh, cycling revolutions, the amount of time since the last uh, uh, information that I had, uh, both on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the speed and the cadence side. Right. So, so now we have data about um, the, uh, the number of revolutions their wheel has gone, how long it's been since the last time, um, and how fast you've kind of cranked. And again, you can do some bit manipulation. If you're comfortable with streams, like with RxJS, there are some tools that can make this a little bit easier. Again, there's, there's math here, um, but the important part is that at the end of the day, you end up getting a, uh, a value, which you know, it's just basic geometry that says how fast you're going in kilometers per hour. So as I, uh, so this is the, kind of the end result of it is that again, I can connect up And now as I start to pedal, you can see both my speed in kilometers per hour and my cadence. You know, they, they say that, uh, that a good standard kind of cadence is around 100 uh, RPM. Uh, I never uh, get to that level. So I ended up winding myself a lot preparing for this talk. Um, so I'll, I'll be happy to take a break afterward. Okay, so, so we built out, uh, you know, so there are, like there's a lot of apps that already connect up speed and cadence sensors. Um, so like, what's, what's the value here? Well, like, what do you actually do with it? And the answer is you, you build dumb applications and just kind of get silly with it. So what I tried to build out was an integration with everyone's favorite game from 2015 um, and, and a, a cadence sensor. So in this case, I called it Flappy Bike. Uh, and this was, this is a fun, Kind of ridiculous game uh, that uh, that I had way too much fun building out and playing. So the way this works is after you connect up and start pedaling, you're just playing the Flappy Bike game or Flappy Bird, except uh, that the faster you pedal, the higher up your uh, bird or logo goes. So you have to slow down or speed up. Uh, to try and navigate through the pipes. When you're in the middle, it's not particularly bad. If you have to go low, then you have to start pedaling slower. And then if you need to pedal up higher, well, you know, we can't, we can't all win. That's about as good as I was in Flappy Bird anyway. So that's what Bluetooth. Uh, there's, there's a lot of really cool things that you can do. Um, with this, uh, you know, but but you have to have the right browsers for it. The gist of where this is available is that on most Chrome-based browsers or Chromium-based browsers, um, it's been available for for a number of years now. Um, so that means that your Chromes, your uh, Android browsers, Samsung Internet, uh, and Microsoft Edge now um, all support this out of the box. You know, there's still a lot of red here, right? You have Firefox, Safari, um, a lot of the other browsers don't have the support. So depending on what you're doing, right? If you just look at usage, then um, this might be enough. You know, if you're specifically targeting Chrome-based devices, well, then you know the the good news is that almost every device, um, whether it's on Windows, on Linux, on Android, Chrome OS, uh, they all have it available. So this might be all you need. You know, it's 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 pretty cool that uh, that it's available so broadly. There are a couple of questions about uh, the security of letting a web browser talk to your physical devices, um, and that's understandable. You know, uh, uh, hardware integration um, has not always had the best history um, for uh, for for connecting up in a secure way. Um, but luckily, the Bluetooth uh, working group has thought through at least a little bit of this. 
So the first thing that uh, you have to that you have to make sure is that uh, it's only available on browsers that have HTTPS. So uh, to prevent people from man the middle or snooping the data uh, that's being sent back and forth. Um, the data is only available from Bluetooth low energy devices. Um, so you can't connect up to um, uh, you know uh, uh, things that have higher bandwidth. Um, so just the the physical devices kind of like these. In order to connect up to a device um, or even prompt, it requires user interaction, which means that you can't just get like the, um, you know, you can't just get a prompt without doing something beforehand. So you have to click on a button or you have to tap a keyboard event or do something first in order for that prompt to come up. And then you have to accept it. Um, so, so there's some level of, um, you know, acceptance or proactive work that a user has to do to even be prompted for um, these devices. And there's a set of sensitive services that, uh, that are just forbidden from being used. Um, you can't connect up to human input devices like blue, uh, keyboards or mice, um, because that's a very easy way to create key loggers. Um, and things like serial numbers are blacklisted from trying to return. Um, and again, that's to prevent things like fingerprinting um, on, a, on a device. So there, there's some level of security, but, uh, but obviously, you know, this is with great power, uh, Spider-Man uh, comes great responsibility. And again, like the, the question that you might ask is, okay, well, yeah, I get it, but like, this is still kind of silly. And it is silly, but I think there's still value in it. Um, you know, for one, I think it's just kind of fun to be able to void a warranty or just like open up the hood. Like there, there's some level of curiosity and playfulness that you can get just from taking a device that you've had just sitting on a shelf and start writing code with it inside of a browser you know, as an example, um, this is a uh, this is a uh, a cloud-enabled um, pet that uh, you you know that out of the box was supposed to uh, connect up, and then it could like send um, you know you could write messages to it, send it out. But you know, maybe you want it to be a Dalek instead. It's that's kind of up to you. Um, and so, so this is kind of fun and playful, um, but. After, after building this out, um, Troy Hunt had found that um, the original app that was being used to send and receive data had massive vulnerabilities in it um, that, uh, uh, that hackers had accessed the cloud store uh, for all of the you know, official data that was being sent through the official app and, um, and uh, both retrieved it uh, and had ransomware uh, associated with it. So they said, I'm gonna send out all of the recordings that you made to your kids through this app, unless you pay us money, right? The vulnerability there was in the official app. So if all that you were using it was just from your local uh, web enabled application, then like that vulnerability gets closed. So you have a little bit more control over your applications if you're not trying to like send it off to some cloud service, like there, there might be some value in that. It also just generally is more private, again, because that you are in full control of the data that's being sent and you can determine whether you wanna like store it just locally or if you wanna send it off to you know, some other uh, system. You know, I really like this quote that the S in IoT stands for security. And after, after looking at some of the permissions that the official apps uh, ask for, I, like that it starts to like make sense. You know, if you're, uh, like the the light bulb uh, that I access, like the the amount of permissions that the official app starts to ask for, like it it wants to know about my camera for some reason, uh, it wants to know about all of the phone calls that I've made. It's like no, I I'm not going to give you those permissions. I just want this to be sandboxed in a browser using software that I've written myself. So there's a level of privacy that is afforded to you once you start taking control of that connection using Web Bluetooth. And this isn't just theoretical. Um, there have been a number of vulnerabilities and, um, and broken promises that official Internet of Things apps uh, uh, end up exposing on people. Um, at DEF CON a few years ago, uh, a couple of researchers had found that, um, uh, that a set of adult toys, which were Bluetooth enabled, um, were sending real-time usage data without notifying users uh, about them to the manufacturer. Um, this is both gross 
uh, and also is a potential uh, violation of privacy, especially in many cases uh, in several states where access or control of this um, still is a prosecutable offense. Again, just being able to take control of this of this data is something that's um, you know that, that gives you a lot of power, and um, and and I think is worth it on its own. So so again, like just being able to control your devices, even if nothing else, there's still some value in that. If you're producing software, then there's value in uh, using Web Bluetooth because again, you don't have to download an app. If you have Chrome or a Chrome type of application, you can reduce the friction just by pressing a button and now you have access to you know, physical devices that are available. One type of app, one application that's taking advantage of this is um, Kinemath. So this is, uh, so there's a number of, like I mentioned, Bluetooth enabled indoor bicycle trainers, speed sensors, cadence sensors, things like that. Um, Zwift is a popular example of this. But all of those require you to download specific software or apps on devices. Whereas Kinemap just runs inside of a browser. So if you have a Bluetooth um, physical sensor, then you can just say connect up and start um, start using it directly. Like, you know, the, the amount of friction that you end up having between your product and your users gets reduced, uh, you know, a high level when there's not an app that has to be downloaded or like some other software that you have to install. But again, I, I don't want to discount that it's just kind of fun to play around with these. So like if you have a weirdo project, then that's great. And like there's no end to the types of things that you can do with this. As another example that I got to play with, um, I had found a set of LED light strips. Um, you know, you can use these generally to like under light uh, uh, cabinets, things like that. And there's a Bluetooth controller that you can reverse engineer and uh, build out websites. So here's an example of a, a project that I did for one of my bicycles um, for, a, uh, for a holiday light uh, project, uh, which was done uh, last year. So you can connect up to the Bluetooth controller. Uh, and then as this opens up, then you can, uh, you know, this lets you uh, change, the, uh, change the colors that I had taped uh, along, the, uh, uh, along the bike. So the way that I uh, that I used this was it was a group ride uh, back when that was still a thing, uh, and uh, and then I just gave people uh, access to this website. I said go here, um, and then I let any random person that was riding along with me change the color of my bike lights um, as I was playing, or uh, as I was riding. So I would start pedaling, and then I noticed that my colors went to like this shimmering pink, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, you know, and and it's not just you, like you can piggyback off of anyone. Um, the Opera development team uh, a few years ago had taken a, a Sphero. Um, those were those, uh, those uh, Bluetooth enabled toys. Um, and there was a BB-8 version of this uh, that came out a few years ago. And they did some experimenting as well. And they said, oh, it looks like you can actually change the colors uh, that are emitted out from this toy using Bluetooth. So they wrote some software that lets you just generally connect up uh, and change the colors, you know, back and forth one way or the other. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I was able to, you know, take that same code and just extend it um, to, uh, you know, to create a little uh, Simon game. So as it connects up. You know, I'm not great at it, but, but again, it's just, it's fun. So, so I hope that you're inspired to take a look at the web Bluetooth uh, tools, uh, you know, make a few playground applications. You don't need to run a lot of code. Uh, and, and I found it to be just a really fun hobby um, uh, to, to build out, you know, there, there's no end in sight. And especially if you're looking at the, at med.com or just finding whatever bargain basement Bluetooth, um, the possibilities are endless there. So again, uh, that's that's everything that I had. Um, there's plenty more information available at uh, my website, uh, the link that I'm uh, sharing here. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for letting me present and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I know we've got a couple. Um, 
first, uh, this is from Okay, so the first question we have uh, is from Groove Coder. Can web Bluetooth uh, be accessed from a service worker to create an offline web app that utilizes Bluetooth? Um, that's a great question. I don't know. I haven't used it inside of a service worker. I know that you can use web Bluetooth in progressive web applications, um, but you may need to be inside the main context of the website as opposed to um, inside of a service worker. I think that the navigator a uh, global variable isn't available inside a service worker from what I remember, but I think that'd be a great experiment to try out. Gotcha. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, T. Siro, butchering that. Uh, was there a lot of latency between pedaling and where your flappy bike ended up in the game? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, I demoed this at one of our local maker fairs uh, last year. And that was the biggest complaint that, that I had heard was just trying to use a bicycle as a game controller. Turns out it wasn't really designed for that. Um, so the, there was about a second's worth of latency um, that you end up, end up having to resolve with. Um, my next project that I was hoping to play around with was using a power meter, um, which tends to provide slightly more real-time data, but I haven't quite cracked the nut on parsing that data yet. Gotcha. Um, Patrick asks, is there a way to add security on top of existing uh, Bluetooth energy BLE connections? Um, you have to start with the security that's already available. Um, so in some cases, that's actually harder than it might look. Um, I had tried to experiment with a friend. Um, they have a, a, a continuous glucose meter um, uh, sensor, which is used for folks with uh, type 1 diabetes. And they, uh, they had found that um, trying to connect, so it's Bluetooth enabled, but you can't access it with web Bluetooth. Um, there's a level of encryption that's stored on top of the BLE specification. And we weren't ever, ever able to, uh, uh, to figure out how to reverse engineer that. Awesome. Uh, I, that's all the questions I have directly. If there was anything else you wanted to add, or if you have any questions people usually ask. By all means, if you were to self ask a question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think the, the main thing that people always ask is just why. Um, and you know, the, the answer is just because because it's there. Um, so yeah, the if nothing else, this is just still just waste way too much fun. Um, and I've spent a whole lot of rainy afternoons uh, playing around with this. Um, the the latest uh, toy that I had gotten access to was this um this angle finder. Uh, which is also Bluetooth enabled. So, right, you can figure out like exactly what angle you have. Um, and there's Bluetooth on it for some reason. So my hope was to build a little game where if you got, like if you're holding it like this so you can't see what the actual number is uh, and then push a button that like, show me exactly what 32 degrees is. Uh, all right, I think it's probably about this. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, I hope you have fun with it. Yeah, uh, we did, We sorry, we got one more question come in, came in. Uh, do the, and this is from JDS Spider. Uh, do the latest native browsers on Android and iOS already have sufficient support for web Bluetooth? So, um, so on Android, Bluetooth. yeah, on Android, the answer is yes. Um, you know, every every Chromium enabled browser, whether that's Chrome, Samsung Internet, um, they all support web Bluetooth out of the box. So, um, you know, and it's a really great experience uh, from what I found. iOS, Safari doesn't support it, so you kind of have to go off on your own. Um, there is a third party uh, browser kind of like uh, that you can download from the app store um, that allows you to connect up um, uh, to web Bluetooth, but you kind of have to seek it out and it costs like $2. So as a distribution mechanism, there's like, you can't expect everyone to do that. Um, but if you just want to play around with it, then you have access to it. Gotcha. Uh, I had a question. Uh, this was more specific to biking. Uh, what, what's your cycling stats? Oh, uh, you would have to check on my Strava to to find out. I am I am a uh, oh, I'm a very you. slow rider, um, <laughs> but uh, but I really I really enjoy those uh, those long gravel uh, distant uh, bike rides. Um, so one uh, some some year I'm gonna make it down to Stillwater. Um, you have your Mid South, uh, which is just one of the premier oh, gravel yeah. races, uh, and you know uh, hopefully it's hopefully it's up and running next year. Uh, I think that's going to be it. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Uh, appreciate
presenting for us. Thanks, Max. Have a good day.